let me introduce to you and please give a very warm welcome to our guest Raghuram Rajan who is the governor of the Indian Reserve Bank, the Indian Central Bank and has made a great effort to be here today. So please give him a very warm hand. And Raghuram, I don't know if you were aware of this, but um, there's a tradition here at St. Gallen on, on some occasions at least when we have these one-on-one -on -one interviews of setting things up with a, with a question. Um, and I think it's very uh, appropriate today because India is going through its own huge democratic uh, experience right now with an election which, forgive me, but does seem to take rather a long time. Uh, but I guess there are good reasons when you've got 1.2 billion people in your nation. Uh, so democracy is very much on Indian minds right now, so we're going to have a very tiny little democratic exercise ourselves. We've got this one question which was thought up by the great brains at St. Gallen as something that was... was um, relevant and apposite to some of the comments you've been making recently and we might chew it over once we've seen the vote but here we go ladies and gentlemen you've got to use your uh, smartphones or your um, tablets or whatever you've got to do some digital communication I think uh, you don't have voting machines do you you've, you've got to use your smartphones or whatever uh, uh, goodness <laughs> Uh, yeah. Ah, well, you know, that means two people have voted. Uh, <laughs> uh, right, three people have voted. You're doing very well, four. Goodness me, I, let's get to a point where I can't guess how many people have voted. Um, but for those of you who can't read very well, I haven't got your glasses, the proposition is the US Federal Reserve is running selfish economic policies at the expense of emerging markets. It is a rather important theme and one that Raghuram Rajan has been talking about um, and you're cleverer than me because you've all figured out how to vote. I'm still struggling because I don't see a, uh, a, a sort of uh, internet uh, address that you're supposed to be voting or a Twitter feed. Ah, good. Ah, great. The system does work. Fantastic. Anyway, look, um, I'm going to give this another, I'm going to just uh, play for time for another sort of 20 seconds and let's just see. You've all got to vote as quick as you can, otherwise your vote won't count. Because um, Raghuram needs to factor this into his responses, you see, he needs to gauge his audience. So I think it's fairly clear, without prejudging anything, that uh, our audience generally, by a clear majority, feels that yes, there is a selfishness around the way the US Federal Reserve has been uh, running its uh, economic policies um, at the moment, which and this is where we switch into interview mode, maybe music to your ears. No, uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, first I, I saw it was an investigative interview. That means I'm accused of something? Uh, no, no, well, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. I think no. we'll, we'll make a decision about that as we go along. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, first I won't use the word selfish when I describe uh, U.S. monetary policy. Uh, the U.S. Fed is doing what it thinks is, is most appropriate and, and when you talk to Fed officials, they would even say that they have uh, the interests of the global economy uh, certainly at the back of their mind, if not at the front of their mind. Uh, the key question is, is why I have been uh, uh, saying that they could do better. Uh, not just the Fed, but, but globally, why we should do better uh, in terms of monetary policy. And, and my uh, concern is that our each country sat on its own bottom. Global capital flows were relatively uh, minor. In fact, post Bretton Woods, we tried to put an end to cross-border capital flows that were not regulated. And as those capital flows have come back, I think monetary policy, especially from the large economies of the world, tends to permeate throughout the global economy. And I think with the extraordinary monetary policies that have been followed, the unconventional monetary policies in recent years, you could say it has even more of an impact. And uh, my question really is, are we sure the impact is on net positive for the world of some of these policies? Are they doing more good domestically and less harm internationally? Or are they doing relatively little good domestically but have spillover effects internationally, which we're all facing. And I come down on the side, again, uh, on the basis of 
uh, you know, uh, one could argue I could do much more analysis of this and study and come back five years later with a definite answer. But seeing what's happening, certainly as far as the emerging markets go, it seems to me that perhaps we could do better than where we are. And, and to be specific, this is an opinion that you've come to having watched the reaction of the Fed and, and global uh, economic monetary policy makers in the post-08 financial crash period. And in particular, your concerns about the impact of quantitative easing. Is that right? Well, I think the first phase of quantitative easing, as the first phase of a number of policies that central banks followed, was exactly what the world needed to, to fix broken financial markets, to fix broken financial institutions. That was what we needed in 2008. I think as we went into 2010 and started or continued relying on monetary policy to bail the world out of this uh, post-recession trauma, I think we were relying too much on the wrong instrument. And at that point, I think a continuation of both ultra-low monetary policy for long, as well as the unconventional monetary policies, QE3, four, uh, QE2 and 3, and uh, um, you know, these have had the effect, to my mind, of having little domestic positive impulse, but having more uh, negative spillovers, both on domestic financial markets and industrial countries. Asset prices have been boosted in a variety of places, but also having international spillovers. That is, there are cross-border capital flows which ignited credit booms in a number of countries. And now, as we are contemplating exit, both for financial markets in industrial countries as well as the credit markets in developing countries, it will be a more difficult period. But, uh, you know, the, the uh, ruthless journalist in me is inclined to say, what on earth do you expect something called the U.S. Federal Reserve to do except look after the interests of the United States? It isn't called the International Federal Reserve or the Global Federal Reserve. It is accountable to the people of the United States. It is its job to ensure that it gets the best result possible for the economy of the United States. Uh, absolutely. So I, I don't dispute that. Uh, in the longer term, now that we are a much more integrated world than we were, now that capital flows sort of uh, go across the world in, in, in seconds, I think we should revisit the issue of whether the US Federal Reserve should have only a domestic mandate. But the reason I say it's in the U.S.'s own interest is because, in part, I believe the domestic positive effects of such kinds of policies are limited. That's, that's my view as an economist. It's, it's not something that I would inflict from the outside on the Federal Reserve. It's, it's a personal view. But I think the, the other aspect of it is that these policies tend to rebound over time. And let me give you the example of uh, uh, Ben Bernanke, who in 2005 talked about the global savings glut and said, wasn't it problematic that there were emerging markets, uh, in particular China, which were building huge reserves, uh, and wasn't that depressing global demand, but also creating very low interest rates in the United States. And what I have been saying is if we are not sufficiently farsighted, if we are very myopic in the way we look at monetary policy today, we risk missing the fact that many emerging markets are taking away from this particular episode the belief that when push comes to shove, you're on your own. The U.S. will do what's in the U.S.'s best interest. Therefore, when emerging markets get the chance, don't expose yourself. Don't run large current account deficits. Don't buy the stuff that other countries want to sell you. Run narrow current account deficits, build reserves, main, make sure your currency doesn't get uncompetitive because in the long run you're on your own. There's a bit of, a threat, that a bit of a, that, an element of threat in what you're saying that no, you, you're suggesting... It's you know, realism. You, well, it's realism. It's realism. Well, because, well, 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 but with respect, what's not realistic, it seems to me, is it, when you just slipped in the phrase, maybe it's time for the Fed, the U.S. Fed, to have a mandate that goes beyond the national and is, is more international in outlook and considers the needs of the emerging economies. To me, that isn't realism. That's arguably idealism, but it, it doesn't seem like it's got a remote chance no, of attracting any no, support uh, in the U.S. US Congress, I'm, I'm taking this in two steps. One is a realistic sense that 
if, uh, if everybody believes that everybody's on their own, we're going to get suboptimal policies. So it's better that we actually talk to one another. Now, this is not just about the emerging markets. Think about the ECB today, which has tremendous pressure on it to become more accommodative, right? That with interest rates which are historically low. Yeah. And uh, think about what Draghi said yesterday. He said, look, it's the exchange rate which is hurting us. Now, why was the exchange rate hurting the euro area with such accommodative policies? Because everybody else is following even more accommodative policies. So I'm saying the spillovers aren't just to emerging markets. They're global. And the real question is, is this the policy setting that we need for the global economy? Uh, some people will say, no problem. I mean, what harm can lax monetary policy do? What calm, harm can low interest well, rates do? Over the long run, they do create a whole set of stresses, not just in the financial sector, but elsewhere. Okay, so how do you get this global optimum economic management? Do you get it just through this loose word that you use, cooperation between different Federal Reserves, having you chat much more often and more openly with Janet Yellen as it is today? Or do you need a new financial structure? Do you need something that looks, you know, remarkably like a... A, a, a global reserve operation. So, uh, again, I, I think it's unrealistic to believe that mandates will change in the short run, uh, especially given so much uh, concern about growth across the world. Nobody's going to change their central bank's mandate. Well, the uh, U.S. Congress sure as heck isn't going to be buying a lot of what you're saying. Right absolutely. Now. Uh, uh, but first, I would, I would ask... Um, multilateral organizations to take a dispassionate view of these policies and to see if in the long run they're beneficial for the global economy. So one, I'd, I'd want them to pay much more attention rather than applauding from the sidelines and saying, wonderful, for the most part, the BIS has been much more circumspect than uh, some other multilateral institutions. But we need to take a dispassionate view. Are these on net positive rather than assuming they're positive uh, to, to begin with? Um, and, and second, I would hope that this kind of discussion uh, starts focusing attention on the possibilities, not just in the short run, of, you know, do, should I adapt, this is the way some people have put it to me, should the Federal Reserve adapt its monetary policy to conditions in India? Of course not. But should it think about the long run consequences of the policies it's adopting? Yes, it should. And my guess is Federal Reserve people do think about that, and I think increasingly so as these kinds of discussions become more more open. The problem is that when people like you say this and suggest that, you know, uh, the, the world as a whole is losing out, that is far from optimum economic management for the, for the global economy, the way things work right now with the dominant Fed and the sorts of decisions the Fed takes, the, the counter view is that you use those arguments simply because countries like India are avoiding very difficult economic decisions of their own. I mean, to quote Jack Lew, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, when he was commenting on the, the sort of late autumn crisis after it, was, it seemed QE was about to end and your economy and, and Brazil and others had suffered serious currency volatility and, and fear was sweeping your markets, Jack Lew said this, he said, countries that have taken tough actions and are managed well are having a different, and he meant more positive, experience than those that are not being managed well. So maybe your perspective right now is a cover for the fact that your own economy isn't being managed very well. Well, first, uh, it's not um, I only who say these things. Um, John Taylor, for example, who was under secretary of the U.S. Treasury and is a prominent monetary economist uh, at Stanford, has been saying this for some time. He says we are at, at, at globally suboptimal monetary policies. So uh, one, could, one could take up his views and say that, uh, that perhaps uh, he doesn't have an axe to grind uh, if you think I have one. Uh, that said, uh, uh, countries like mine have taken their medicine. 
Uh, right now we have money again pouring out of our ears because it's coming in again because they like what they see. They see that we've taken uh, an axe to the current account deficit, brought it down to 1% from 6.5%. They see that we raised interest rates three times, something that industrial countries haven't done for a long, long time. We raised interest rates. Uh, we did uh, take an axe to the fiscal deficit. We, we, at a much lower level of GDP, at a level of GDP which is one 20th, 130th, uh, that of industrial countries have taken the hard medicine. So nobody can accuse us of not taking our own medicine. And it, in fact, the proof of the pudding is markets have re-rated us and the money's coming in once again. Now, I'm not saying this from uh, the perspective of our country at this point in time. I'm saying it from the perspective of a global system which is broke. And it is a system which I have no doubt a few years down the line we will hear again industrial countries saying, okay, now that we're coming out, but these emerging markets are, are intervening in their currency. They're responsible for low global growth. Why don't they change what they're doing? Because after all, they're holding our growth back. Somebody else is going to make a global savings glut speech. Uh, at that point, nobody's going to say, why are the industrial countries whining? It's because they haven't fixed their own problems. It's because these emerging markets, again, are the culprits. I think that's the, that's, that's the wrong way of looking at things. Let us look at things fairly. The global monetary system just doesn't work. Right. Well, it's a powerful statement, and I suspect it will get written up in the St. Gallen uh, summaries. The, the global system, you say, is broke. And I remember you, and I'm sure many of the audience will, being uh, actually one of the most powerful speakers in a movie. Do you remember the movie Inside Job? I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was a movie that was put together, a documentary movie made to try and explain exactly what happened around the sort of financial meltdown of, of um, 08, and you, uh, Raghuram, were uh, one well, of the prescient guys who sort of saw that markets were, were failing before it actually happened. But you seem to be suggesting, and now I'm moving beyond just the sort of work of central banks, but you seem to be suggesting that a lot of the lessons uh, of 2008 haven't been learned and that the international financial system is still dysfunctional. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, uh, um I think that we have done some things to, since 2008 to, to remedy matters. Uh, we focused a lot on regulating the banks better. But I think there are two main areas where we haven't done enough. One, a lot of people will agree with me, which is on the shadow financial system. We're, we're sort of pushing more activity into the shadow financial system by putting more and more regulation on the banks. I'm not saying that regulation is unwarranted. But we also have to ensure that there is a uniformity of regulation across the system, otherwise you're just moving activity from one part of the system to another. You mean irresponsible uh, lending and huge leverage and everything else is, is actually moving into the shadow area and therefore by definition is, is not being regulated and is something, for example, in China that uh, some very serious economic analysts now believe is storing up potentially global problems. Uh, Perhaps, and, and that's an example of, of activity moving to the unregulated parts. And we have to be careful that, that as we increase uh, regulation on the um, unloved bankers, uh, we don't actually make the system uh, more fragile because we push activity into the dark corners of, uh, uh, of the global financial system. But the second, and this is where uh, I, 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 I come back to, uh, um, is we haven't paid enough attention to monetary policy before the crisis and its uh, role in what happened. And I, I think as a result, we are completely comfortable with, again, extremely activist, extremely accommodative monetary policy as an answer to the problems created by the crisis, while you know, some people, certainly I would, argue that it has some culpability for what happened in the crisis in the first place. So are we using, in a sense, the poison uh, to cure the illness created by the poison in the first place? Uh, that, that's certainly something that we need to think about. There are a number of central bankers. I'm not the only one. There's certainly a very responsible organization, the Bank of International Settlements, a few uh, miles from here, which long before I started talking about this has been talking about the concerns associated with uh, um, extremely lax monetary policy. And they've been sounding the alarm again and again to central bankers. Unfortunately, we've ignored them uh, uh, often. Do you think 
uh, we are heading for another financial crisis. I mean, you, you've said quite recently that you believe, with some urgency, you know, international players need to work on creating a, gl a global safety net administered by an international multilateral body, and I guess with your IMF experience, you maybe mean the IMF, I don't know, but, uh, but you know, we need to provide for countries in case of economic emergency, you said, which makes me wonder whether you think another economic emergency is around the corner. No, I, I think the, the one big uncertainty we all face right now is, is the eventual exit from these uh, ultra-accommodative policies. The real point of exit will be when markets focus on when interest rates start rising. But, but markets already know that interest rates are going to start rising. I mean, the Fed signaled late last year that quantitative easing was coming to an end. We know that long-term interest rates are on the rise in the UK as well. I mean, there's only one way to, interest rates are going in the long term. That's up. Markets know that. And for all of the sort of doomsday scenarios that people like you paint, it doesn't... Actually... They, they do know that they will rise, but they don't know when. Uh, I think the, the, the problem, of course, is when the markets start focusing on when the rise is going to come, you already see a rise in interest rates today because markets smooth things over. And the problem then is that every central bank then goes out to say, no, no, not now. We didn't mean just yet. And, and, and the, the danger, the worry is that uh, central banks will keep doing this until economic conditions sort of force their hand in which case the final denouement may be more rapid than we would want. Ideally, it would work the way you're suggesting, that markets slowly anticipate a rise in interest mm. rates and react accordingly. Uh, my sense is many more market participants will stay in their crowded trades, uh, hoping that they will be the last one out, uh, hoping they won't be the last one out, and wait longer than they should until it becomes crystal clear that interest rates are going to go up. So it's at, a game of chicken in a way. There but, is a game of chicken. But, but if that's the case, I, what I want to know, simple answer please, is, is there in your view real potential for another round of economic crisis? I think, I think crisis would be too strong a word. We certainly have uh, learned uh, some things from the most recent one. I don't think the positions are as extreme today as they perhaps were in 2007, but in some areas uh, using uh, um, Alan Greenspan's word, things are frothy. Mm. And uh, you could expect some market volatility when interest rates start rising. I mean, I don't need to, I'm not the first one to talk about junk bonds or, or covenant light bonds, which, uh, which are markets that seem a little frothy at this point. The, 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 the real question is how many people anticipate the change and move out, and how many people wait till the last minute thinking that they will get out in time, in which case we could have more volatility than we anticipate. Let's turn to India. One quick quote from the Financial Times that I, I just happened to write down from uh, a few months back uh, before the election process began. Quote, India has manifestly missed the kind of ec economic opportunity that comes along once in an age. Do you agree with that? No, I don't. I, I, I think that uh, uh, I think the opportunity still is out there. Uh, uh, have we done enough? Absolutely not. Uh, that gives me hope that there's a lot that we can do which is fairly straightforward. Uh, there are lots of low-hanging fruit uh, that, uh, that we can pluck. Uh, and well, I know. Why do people always leave low-hanging fruit? If they're so obviously low-hanging and juicy, how come they're still on the tree? I mean, no, it, 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 you're asking the Chicago question, right? <laughs> why is that $20 bill on the road? Somebody should have picked it up. Well, occasionally those $20 bills do lie on the road. Uh, somebody messed up and left it. Uh, somebody didn't pluck the fruit on time. They're still there. I think they're waiting to be plucked. And uh, uh, no, I mean, a serious answer is yes. There are always, uh, uh, you know, political uh, difficulties sometimes in enacting reforms. Sometimes it is because people are excessively cautious and haven't done what, what is obvious and should be done. Uh, I think there's a mix of both in India, that, uh, that we have missed opportunities uh, one reason why manufacturing is still relatively small in India, it could be far bigger. But we also, uh, in some sense, have been in some ways overly cautious. We haven't sometimes gone against interests 
uh, that we could have gone against without creating a calamity. Uh, and, um, you know... Uh, I mean, the, the, these are systemic problems, aren't they? I mean, I, I, I in the last six weeks, have traveled to both India and China. Um, and you cannot help, and I'm sure you're faced with this the whole time, you cannot help but make comparisons between the true, the two, rather. And when it comes to, uh, you know, job creation, particularly in manufacturing, which you've already alluded to, when it comes to infrastructure delivery and investment, a whole raft of measures, uh, urbanization, uh, on every single sort of measure um, of pace and efficiency of development, India is so far behind China today, and it seems almost the gap is, is widening by the week, and you've got to worry about that. No, I, I think uh, you're right that we are far behind China. I'd say we're not that far, we're 12 years behind, which is about when they start their reforms relative to, to India. We have a lot to learn from China, make no mistake. There is a lot about the effectiveness of their system, their ability to implement, implement uh, a, 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 a sort of discipline which uh, we certainly need. But of course, some of uh, the, uh, the looseness of Indian implementation, uh, I don't want to blame democracy, but comes also <laughs> from, uh, from, from the democratic dialogue that takes place. Uh, if we want to build uh, a high-speed railway line, uh, we can't assume it will be done in the next two years. There is a process of dialogue that has to be initiated with the farmers who are in the way as we try and acquire their land. It takes more time. And does that system have to be changed? I don't think so. I think the longer run, the system uh, will produce growth. And I, w before the current slowdown, India was growing at 8 or 9%. I have no doubt if we do pluck those low-hanging fruit, uh, we will get back to something which looks like seven or eight. Now, beyond that, I think we need uh, a special set of circumstances. Uh, but I think even seven or eight with a democratic environment is plenty to be proud of. It's faster than many countries have grown in history. Of course, still slower than China, but we'll take it with the kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of environment in which we grow. How, how much, uh, well, how many levers in the economy and economic management can you actually pull and pull independently because as I understand it you're you're not a fully independent governor of the Indian Reserve Bank your relationship with the politicians is quite complicated and you know uh, one could argue and one could even if one was being provocative read within your last answer uh, implicit criticism of a generation of Indian politicians so how much independence and how much real power and influence have you got no, uh, the central bank uh, works with the finance ministry, of course. Uh, we have, uh, I have regular conversations with the finance minister and the... Positive or negative? Positive. Uh, Always. No, I mean, there are differences in opinion all the time. Uh, where, where were your key differences with Mr. Chidambaram, who I happened to see the other day? <laughs> no, be, no, I, mean, uh, I, I, I have cordial relationships, uh, uh, relations with him. Uh, the, the, the most important, uh, I, I think, uh, we control a lot of levers, especially on financial sector development. We control, of course, monetary policy. Uh, in India, uh, what happens is uh, when we want to do something big, uh, we go tell the government, this is what we want to do, and the government is uh, usually supportive. Sometimes if there are things that the government thinks could help, it does some things on its own. Sometimes it thinks, here, why don't you do this a little differently? Here's why. Uh, we, we talk to each other. But in terms of independence, I would say across the world, central banks, uh, nobody uh, has a central bank which sits on an isolated, in an isolated tower and does what it does without looking outside the window. Uh, the U.S. Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, is uh, by and large independent, but they do care about the economic and political environment, and they see that they are in many ways shaped by that, and I think that's true across uh, uh, the industrial as well as the developing world. The key question is what kind of equation you develop with the government. Uh, I determine monetary policy. I say what it is. The government can fire me. But the government doesn't set monetary policy. Mm. Uh, so in that sense, am I independent? Well, uh, I'm happy to talk to the government. I'm happy to listen to the government. But ultimately, the interest rate that is set is set by me.
I I'm very tempted to ask you uh, how you uh, think things are going to pan out with the uh, election and who you might be working with in a few weeks' time, but I suspect you won't give me a very full answer, so uh, maybe I won't waste my breath on that. But um, what, you know, what are your key objectives? What are your targets when you are setting your monetary policy in India? You know, India, unfortunately, still has a huge chunk of the world's poorest people within it. It has a huge unemployment and underemployment problem. Now, you know, when you're setting interest rates and running monetary policy, is your prime concern India's inflation rate? Is it India's employment conditions? How formal are you about your targets? How, you know, what, what's driving you? Well, we've been trying to uh, lay out a clear monetary framework. And I think uh, for India to get sustainable growth, the first thing it has to do is bring down inflation. Uh, we have very high rates of inflation compared to the rest of the world. That creates all sorts of problems uh, domestically. It does put pressure on the exchange rate, etc. We need to bring down inflation. That's, uh, you know, without that, we don't get sustainable growth. So I don't think there's an inflation growth trade-off as some people uh, talk about. Uh, once we bring inflation down to uh, much lower levels, and we've indicated a path through which we'll do that, uh, then we can start talking about the rest of what monetary policy can do. But I think as a central banker in a developing country, we have so many more tools to uh, affect growth because we can develop the financial sector. We can bring a whole set of new institutions. We can reach people for whom interest rates don't even matter because they haven't borrowed, they, haven't, they have no savings. They don't have access to a bank. They don't have access to a bank. And, and so one of the uh, really interesting challenges at this time is to uh, expand financial access. How do we reach every part of India? And for that, we're trying to use technology. We have some of the best payment system technology in the world. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art uh, real-time gross settlement system, but we, we do many more, massively more payments than most other payment system in the world. Uh, and so trying to use the benefits of Indian technology, which much of the world is, uh, uh, can see on the software side, but use it to expand access uh, by reducing transaction costs. Can we get e a, a person with a 100 rupee account, which is uh, basically 1.5 US dollars, can we get them to be able to have a sustainable bank account, uh, which the bank uh, doesn't feel uh, that it's making a loss on in, uh, in offering that? Um, safe payments, safe remittances. Can somebody who's a laborer in the remote part of India send money back to his village without 10% being skimmed off the top uh, by the financial system or even more? So these are the kinds of things which I, will which I think will help first bring more people into, into the, the formal system but also expand growth significantly more. So it's not just monetary policy. We need monetary policy to do the right thing, mm. but we can develop the economy also. In developed Western economies, the assumption when we start talking about the generational challenge is, is to feel that you know, um, the older generation is in some ways through its sort of greed and its inertia and everything else failing the younger generation and robbing the younger generation of a, of a, of a future. Um, in India, I dare say that a lot of the younger generation look at the current generation of leaders in your country and their main concern is corruption. Just the, the, the way in which the resources of your country are being misused and abused by a generation which every single analysis of this suggests is very corrupt. You got a role to play in trying to deal with that? Um, so uh, first, I, I think you have to look at corruption in the proper perspective. Uh, yes, there is corruption in emerging markets, there is corruption in industrial countries, but of course the degree varies. Uh, what we had was a period of very rapid growth. And in that period of very rapid growth, a lot of the natural resources that were actually of relatively low value, think about spectrum, nobody cared about spectrum when there weren't so many mobile phones around. Uh, think about iron ore, nobody cared about iron ore before China started having a huge demand for iron ore. 
Uh, it was on a first-come, first-served basis. We simply didn't have the institutions to allocate these natural resources in India. And of course, as these resources become, became valuable, we should have developed the institutions. But it was, at that point, more convenient to give it to friends and relatives sometimes, uh, which was not the best way to, 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 to hand it out. Uh, unless you're a friend or a relative, un then it's Unless terrific, you're a friend but... or, or a relative. <laughs> And, and what is happening now is the democratic process is kicking in. Uh, the checks and balances, the Supreme Court, the uh, Controller and Auditor General, these are entities that have taken notice. Why does the world know about the extent of some of these problems? It's because we ourselves have sort of fleshed it out and are telling the world. It's not the Financial Times or, or, or Bloomberg which has uncovered these problems in India. It's the Indian institutions, whether it's the Supreme Court uh, or the uh, Controller and Auditor General. And we're trying to fix it. So the last telecom auction, for example, was done in a clean and transparent way and, and generated a whole lot of revenue for the uh, Indian government. We ourselves, uh, uh, the central bank had to give out banking licenses. The Economist, I remember in an article when I came and speculated that each one of those licenses would be sold for $75 million. Uh, you know, I think we gave it to people that nobody would accuse of having paid any money to get those licenses, but we did it in a very clean and transparent process. So I think the system is reacting. The system is reacting, the institutions are reacting, and slowly uh, we are dealing with the problem. We identified the problem ourselves, and we're slowly dealing with it. Will we get rid of corruption in the next couple of years? No, I mean, I, I think it's a more, uh, it's a difficult problem which we need to uh, resolve. But I would also say that a number of countries have grown. Uh, corruption has come down, but they've grown without Scandinavian levels of probity. Uh, they have grown uh, pretty dramatically. So for the younger generation, of course, uh, we want to create more role models of people to emulate. We want to build a culture where getting ahead doesn't mean bribing the right people. But at the same time, uh, it will take us time to get to uh, the kinds of corruption that one associates with, with, with great countries like, uh, like Norway and, and Sweden. Uh, but that doesn't mean that growth should be put on a shelf to them. No, but the bottom line, one of the shocking things about India and its decade of growth, albeit it's been slower recently, but you've had a decade of extraordinary growth. But what you haven't done, and this again it pertains to this clash of generations thing, you haven't delivered poverty alleviation. You know, a vast proportion of the world's poorest people still live in India. And the numbers, the figures on the numbers of Indians who have no access to running water, clean water, have no access to an indoor toilet, all of these things, the numbers are shocking. And Indians by the million are being born every year with no real prospect, it seems, of that changing. I mean, why has Indian growth thus far not translated into massive, rapid poverty alleviation? Well, you're, the numbers you're quoting are about levels. If you look at the changes, there has been massive poverty alleviation, certainly over the last two decades when we had very, very strong growth. Uh, so go to a village in India today, you'll see a transformation. This is a different village from the village that existed uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, nowadays, uh, you see motorcycles routinely. You see, you see I'm sorry scooters. to bring China into it again, but the numbers positive direction, but compared with China in terms of poverty alleviation over the last 20 years, well, a terrible record. Were well, you pointing to the country that has grown the fastest in history? And in that history. The, your country it, likes to compare itself with. N no. <laughs> It, it's good for us to set ourselves up against a, a you know, a top-class benchmark. Uh, and, and yes, we do like to compare ourselves, but we're not saying we're anywhere near. We need to do a lot more to get to those kinds of levels of growth. The U.S. grew at one and a half to two percent over a hundred years, which is when it became rich. Uh, Australia, Canada, take any industrial country, the rates of growth as they grew in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, they grew at very slow rates, but over a long period of time. When you look at the Asian countries today, Japan, Korea, uh, uh, China, you're looking at miracles of the modern world. Yes, it says we can do it, India should be able to do it, and that is why I'm confident we'll get back to the 8, 9, 10% growth. We will do it. 
uh, with currently slowing down. But, but the problem well, is if the 8, 9 or 10 percent growth simply uh, expands the inequality India, problem in India's, your country. In, India is one of the more equal uh, poor countries. Uh, the Gini coefficient in India is, is, is relatively low. Uh, can we do better? Of course we can do better. Uh, can we create more jobs? Of course we can create more jobs. Now we haven't, this is the low hanging fruit we talked about, manufacturing in India is 15% of GDP. Mm. We haven't created a manufacturing revolution unlike every other Asian economy. And that was a terrible mistake. Um, but that was partly conscious policy. Uh, well, it was lack of policy, if you will, well. that we didn't create the infrastructure, we didn't create the, uh, the, the competition, uh, which could have uh, generated much stronger manufacturing growth. But that, to my mind, is not a missed, uh, missed, missed boat or a missed bus. It can still happen. And I think over the next few years, with a stable government, uh, with the right kinds of actions, it can still happen. I'm now going to throw it open to uh, you guys to ask the right question. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Anthony. I'm from Singapore. So we're in a global monetary prisoner's dilemma, so to speak. Um, is it even possible to create any kind of supranational arrangement which can you know, make it sort of enforce this kind of coordination that you're talking about? Mm. Um, good question, but uh, you know, first, who, which amongst the supranational institutions has the kind of public trust and credibility amongst nations? Uh, and second, uh, assuming uh, such an entity could be found, uh, we have to make a further assumption that the economic thinking and discussion uh, would result in models that have a clear outcome so that we could say, you're out of line, fix your problems. Uh, I don't think we're at that level even in, in the sphere of economics. So I think we're a far way from there. That is not to say that we could move some direction towards that with a more even-handed uh, discussion of global economic policies and the spillover effects of those policies. Uh, I think uh, it, it can't be that there's a model which spits out who's in line and who's out of line, but I think we could certainly have the discussion. Uh, just as a little parenthesis, there, are you of the view, as many in the uh, non-sort of uh, Western world are, that the, the supranational uh, economic institutions that we have, the IMF, the World Bank, their credibility going forward rests upon fundamental reform of their structures to ensure that they're not seen in the future as dominated by the United States and Europe in the way that perhaps they have been in the past? Well, I, I think they themselves recognize that they need, uh, they need reform so that they're seen more broadly in the world as, as, uh, as being uh, having a more equitable governance you, structure. I mean, you, you served the IMF uh, for quite a number of years as chief economic advisor, chief economist. Uh, did you seethe with frustration while you were there that it was such an uh, institution dominated by Western and particularly U.S.? Interests? No, I, I would say f that, uh, that for the most part I was given a, a long leash and I could speak my mind. Uh, but. Uh, and, and, you know, it was in part a response to these kinds of, uh, of, of concerns uh, that made them look more broadly for, for their chief economist. But uh, I think that uh, uh, more, as much as changing the governance structure goes, emerging markets also have to play an important role in assuming more responsibility as well as participating in the agenda setting. All too often, and uh, this is something that uh, uh, I, I worry about, uh, because we don't have the same kind of, uh, of uh, e you know, training uh, in, uh, in economic policy making, we perhaps don't belong to the same schools and so on, uh, we don't participate in the agenda setting. Uh, we don't push harder for what kinds of uh, um, sort of solutions we want, and instead we are reactive. There is a solution which is negotiated in Washington which comes out and then we decide whether we like it or not. Instead, I think it's more, uh, we should be more forthcoming in proposing different agendas and in suggesting that we debate these different agendas rather than go with the agendas which are already set. Okay. Hi, my, my name is Charles I come from France. I'd like to insist on this point because when we listen to you like the idea, I mean, 
I feel like this is mostly a central banker's uh, discussion. So whether uh, each of you is doing his own business or you work together, but given the importance of the matter, uh, I would assume that uh, other people might have a say in the, the discussion of building uh, uh, global governance in terms of monetary policy. So my question is uh, basically who can have a, a say and uh, maybe help or advise or pressure uh, central bankers to work together a bit more? Um, you know, uh, as you say, um, it is, as we've already discussed, a complicated uh, situation. Uh, I think in the current environment, any hint that U.S. monetary policy or, or European monetary policy is being determined by any outside entities, given the complications already uh, domestically, is going to be seen as, as uh, uh, is going to be seen very, very unfavorably by politicians. So I don't think we're anywhere near there. I think uh, we will need time. We will need more analysis. We will need empirical work to talk about the consequences and the difficulties. So uh, what I'm trying to do is initiate a dialogue. I think what is possible in the, in, the, in, the sh in the short to medium run is central banks internalize a little more uh, the consequences of their policy actions on others. And this requires us to move away a little from the view that these kinds of very accommodative, very unconventional policies are uniformly good uh, or at the least do no harm. And what I've been trying to argue is I'm not sure how much good they do. I'd love to see more evidence that they do good, but I certainly can see some harm that they're doing. And therefore, perhaps in the longer run, we have a better dialogue. That dialogue will lead to work. That work will lead to more discussion. That discussion may eventually, in less fraught international circumstances, lead to a change in, in who determines monetary policy. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Maharshi. I'm from India. Uh, quick question, uh, do you feel as a central banker or for uh, central bankers in general, do they feel handicapped because they don't have much control or much say on fiscal policies and do you feel that monetary and fiscal policies together make a well-functioning economy? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well there's brief and there's too brief. <laughs> Okay. You're, you're, uh, you're allowed another 10 seconds on Okay. That one. Uh, quick answer. Uh, you know, uh, look, uh, I think sometimes, uh, at least in, 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 in the situation we are in in India, uh, there has been some movement on the fiscal side. The government has taken a lot of uh, actions to try and constrain, uh, um, um, consolidate uh, uh, fiscal policy. So uh, I, as a central bank, I can't keep pointing to the government and saying they have to do more. Uh, certainly they're doing something, we should do something ourselves. So I don't feel that uh, uh, you know, we're not in sync on this issue. Let's see what happens. Let's watch Raghuram dealing with the challenges that we've outlined for India. And before we do all of that, let's give him a very big round of applause for today. Thank you very much. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you.